Well, no, I, I the witnesses will be seated. This is the third panel. The final witnesses for today's hearing are Neil Borofsky, the Special Inspector General for TARP, Thomas Baxter, the General Counsel, Executive Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Elias uh, Habayo, the former Chief Financial Officer of the Financial Services Group of AIG, and Stephen Friedman, the former Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and current member of the Board of Director, Directors of Goldman Sachs. May I ask the witnesses to stand while I administer the oath? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witnesses that have answered in the affirmative, you may now be seated. I'll ask the witnesses to summarize their testimony in five minutes. The yellow light means you have a minute left. The red light means stop. And then, of course, we will have time for questions from members uh, whom I uh, now. All the witnesses have opening statements, so I believe that uh, given the four votes, the members will be back by the time your statements are done for questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brofsky, would you present your testimony first? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is a, it's an honor to once again to be back to testifying before this committee. I'd like to thank this committee for the support it's shown our office, as well as its leadership and tenacity in bringing about transparency to the AIG bailout generally and in particular to the counterparty payments. Um, this past November, we issued our audit, an audit that was re requested by Representative Cummings and 26 other members of Congress, including members of this committee, reporting on the decision-making process that led to then-President Geithner and the Federal Reserve making the decision, the choice, to pay 100 cents on the dollar, effectively par value, for a series of securities that at the time were worth less than half of that amount. And as we demonstrate in the audit, that was, in fact, a choice. Uh, a series of policy choices that were made that limited the ability of the Federal Reserve um, in its negotiations and a choice to conduct the negotiations in the way that they did. And in our audit and in our testimony, we lay out the different justifications and explanations given by the Federal Reserve, many of which Secretary Geithner uh, repeated this morning, and our responses and in some cases our criticisms of those policy decisions. What I would like to focus on today, though, is expanding a different theme in the audit, and that is looking at the tone and amount of effort that went into those negotiations, even assuming all of those policy de decisions which restricted the latitude of the Federal Reserve. How are those negotiations conducted? Well, essentially, uh, a number of mid and senior level executives at the FRBNY reached out to their counterpart at AIG's counterparties. They did basically over the telephone and after informing them that um, the, even the negotiations themselves were voluntary, they asked if they would be willing to take a haircut on the, on, the, on the amount, a concession. For seven of the eight, the answer was no. For the eighth, UBS, the answer was yes, so long as the other counterparties also agreed to a similar concession. The Federal Reserve at that point did, decided to shut down negotiations, not to pursue that willingness to go, negotiate, um, and decided with the approval of Secretary Geithner to pay 100 cents on the dollar. Now, 
this stands in stark contrast to a negotiation that occurred just a few weeks earlier. And this, of course, was the negotiation by which the government purchased $125 billion of preferred securities from the nine largest institutions as part of the TARP's capital purchase program. There, unlike in AIG, it were the principals that were involved. President Geithner, Secretary Paulson, and Chairman Bernanke on behalf of the government, and on behalf of the counterparties, the banks, some of the exact same banks uh, that were subject to the AIG discussions, the chief executive officers. There, unlike in AIG, the conversations weren't conducted over the telephone. Each of those CEOs was summoned to Washington and told to appear in a Treasury conference room, gathered together. And there, unlike in AIG, the message was forceful. President Geithner, Chairman Bernanke, Secretary Paulson and others made it very clear of the importance that they believed that this negotiation was, how important it was for the banks to agree. They, they used the terms like that it would be good for the country for them to do so. No such similar effort was taken with respect to the AIG negotiations. And the result with the capital purchase program, 100 percent agreement. The result for the AIG, as we all know, were failed negotiations. Now, would it have made a difference if President Geithner or Secretary Paulson got on the phone and talked to those chief executive officers? Would it have resulted in the savings of billions or tens of billions of dollars for the taxpayer? We don't know. We can't know. But we do know, because we have recently been informed by the French regulator, the same regulator that the Federal Reserve cited their intransigence as being one of the, the great barriers to achieving the effective negotiated haircuts, they recently told SIGTARP that, in fact, they would have been willing to engage in just such a negotiation, so long as it was at a very high level, so long as it was completely transparent, and as long as it was universal agreement. Everyone came around the table. And we also know that if such negotiations occurred and were successful, they would have addressed all of the concerns that Secretary Geithner addressed this morning and many of the concerns that were outlined in our, in our audit of, of concerns by the Federal Reserve. But we will never know because that effort was simply not taken. Madam Chair, our audit covers, uh, I see my time is, is, is running low. Uh, our audit obviously covers a lot of other issues, as does our testimony, including some of the recent troubling um, comments from Treasury that impact transparency. Uh, and of course, I will be available to answer any questions that you or, or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bobrovsky. Mr. Baxter, we would like you to go next. Good afternoon, Madam, Madam Chairman Norton, Ranking Member Issa, and other members of this committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear here today. As the General Counsel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, I welcome the opportunity to talk about the Federal Reserve's work to stabilize AIG at a critical point. I will also address the role played by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in securities disclosures made by AIG. Let me begin with just a few words about autumn 2008, when our nation was challenged by a financial crisis of a kind we had not seen since the Great Depression. At the New York Fed, we were literally working around the clock trying to implement a number of liquidity programs directed toward market stability. Today we consider some of the actions taken during those frenetic times with respect to AIG. Everything we have done since this crisis began has been with the goal of stabilizing our financial system and assisting our economic recovery. Turning to September 2008 and the actions taken by the New York Fed, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and the Department of the Treasury, they were designed to avoid the, systemic, the catastrophic systemic consequences that would have resulted from an AIG bankruptcy. Every American would have been adversely impacted. We did not lend to AIG because we wanted to, but because we had to. A decision not to act might have been easier on us, but it would have been worse for all. Now I will turn to the specific issues that bring me here today. First, there have been concerns about AIG's counterparties receiving large payments for terminating CDS contracts and selling collateralized debt obligations. There have been allegations that this was a backdoor bailout designed by the Federal Reserve to assist the banks at the expense of the American taxpayer. These allegations are not true. 
AIG was scheduled to announce an earnings loss of nearly $25 billion on November 10, 2008. Had we not reached agreement with the counterparties to terminate their credit default swap contracts by that date, by acquiring the CDOs, AIG would have been downgraded by the credit rating agencies and thrown once again to the brink of bankruptcy. This would have returned us to the situation we faced in September and required even further government support. We took the action needed to terminate the CDS contracts by the deadline, and our focus was on solving the AIG liquidity problem, not on benefiting AIG's counterparties. Second, I would like to clarify the misunderstanding that the, Treasury, that the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department received nothing of value in exchange for the payments to AIG's counterparties. As part of the termination deal, the Federal Reserve, through its special purpose vehicle Maiden Lane 3, paid approximately $29 billion and received assets with a fair market value of $29 billion. The par value of the assets was approximately $62 billion. Today, the value of the assets which secure the Federal Reserve's loan exceeds our loan balance by several billion dollars. Third, concerns have been expressed about our involvement in AIG's securities disclosures. In particular, there have been allegations that we somehow tried to engage in a cover-up by recommending that AIG strike certain sentences in its SEC disclosures related to the payments to the counterparties. These allegations are not true. Our sole purpose was to ensure that securities law disclosures by AIG were accurate and appropriately protective of taxpayer interests. Let me finish by thanking the committee for holding this hearing. We submitted an extensive statement yesterday and we have delivered 250,000 pages of documents to you. I believe that, upon careful examination, the committee will see that our actions successfully addressed a potentially calamitous risk to the economy and in doing so protected the interests of the American people. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baxter. Mr. Habayo, we're ready for your testimony. Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. From September 2005 until May of last year, I was Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Financial Div uh, Services Division at American International Group. I left AIG in May 2009 on excellent terms and continued to provide advisory services to the company while I planned the next phase of my career. By way of additional background, I am a licensed CPA and practiced with Deloitte & Touche becoming a partner in 2003. My position with AIG gave me some insights into Maiden Lane 3. Maiden Lane 3 LLC is a financing entity created by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The entity helped facilitate the unwinding of a significant portion of AIG financial products credit default swaps by purchasing the underlying multi-sector uh, CDO bonds from FP swap counterparties. At the same time, the related swaps were terminated. I understand that the committee is interested in learning more about these transactions. These transactions were critical to AIG. They significantly reduced the risk of substantial collateral postings to counterparties that FP was required to make under the swaps. They also reduced the erosion to AIG's capital from mounting mark-to-market -market losses on the swaps. A little history is helpful. During the subprime mortgage crisis, the bonds underlying FP swaps began to decrease in value. As a result, beginning in late 2007 through 2008, FP reported billions of dollars of mark-to-market losses on the swaps under the fair value accounting rules. 
FP also posted billions of dollars in collateral to its swap counterparties as a result of the declining market value of the bonds and declines in AIG's and the reference bond's credit ratings. AIG lacked the financial resources to come up with a large-scale solution. Because AIG is not a bank, it did not have access to funding through the Federal Reserve in the normal course. Instead, AIG had to rely on the capital markets. By the beginning of September 2008, the collateral postings and the mark-to-market -market losses, along with other factors, were straining AIG's liquidity. But AIG was not able to access the capital markets. On September 15, 2008, the rating agencies downgraded AIG, triggering an onslaught of new collateral calls. Even after the federal rescue on September 16, 2008, AIG still needed to reduce its exposure to the mark-to-market losses and collateral calls on FB swaps. The federal rescue did not stop these losses or payment obligations. This is what led to the creation of Maiden Lane 3. Under the terms negotiated by the New York Fed with the swap counterparties, Maiden Lane 3 bought the underlying bonds at the, the then market value. Specifically, Maiden Lane 3 purchased approximately $62 billion in notional amount of bonds underlying FP swaps for a market value of $29 billion. Separately, FP agreed to terminate the swaps for an amount equal to the difference of the bond's notional part value and its not market value. The collateral that FP had posted to date was used to pay the cost of terminating the swaps. Specifically, FP paid the counterparties approximately $33 billion in previously posted collateral to tear up the swaps. So the counterparties ended up with par, a total of approximately $62 billion. To conclude, Maiden Lane 3 was critical in mitigating AIG's continued exposure to the significant mark-to-market losses and collateral calls on the swaps that was draining AIG's capital and liquidity. I am happy to answer any questions the members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bayou. Uh, Mr. Friedman. As indicated in my prepared statement, I have little factual information to offer in response to the questions set forth in the Committee's invitation for me to testify. The explanation for my lack of involvement in the, thank you, in the um, New York Reserve Bank AIG counterparty transactions requires an appreciation of the limited role that a Reserve Bank's chairman and board of directors play in a Reserve Bank's operation. A Reserve Bank's Board of Directors is really more akin to an advisory board. It is, it is actually sort of a hybrid, more akin to that than it is to the Board of Directors of a typical uh, corporation. Reserve Bank directors serve part-time, um, make observations on the economy and markets, make recommendations on monetary policy and approve the bank's budget, internal controls and policies and procedures and, and uh, personnel matters. Um, but consistent with the structure created by the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the directors of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks have no role in the regulation, supervision, or oversight of banks, bank holding companies, or other financial institutions. Uh, such responsibilities including the extraordinary financial interventions of 2008, are instead carried out by the officers of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks acting, acting at the direction and with the oversight of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. Uh, in other words, the Board of Governors in Washington effectively is the Board of Directors uh, for Reserve Bank undertakings such as the AIG financial rescue transactions. Uh, accordingly, uh, as I explained to committee staff and, and consistent with the Fed's ground rules, um, 
whether as chairman of the uh, New York Federal Reserve Board or otherwise, uh, I was not involved in the decision to bail out AIG, the decision to repay the AIG counterparties at par, or the decision not to publicly disclose those counterparties' names. Uh, I did not ratify those decisions, and I do not know um, just who made those decisions. Uh, I am advised that um, on the evening of um, uh, November 9, 2008, the chair of the bank's audit committee and I received a telephonic summary briefing from bank officials about the transaction. Uh, at that point, the deal had been signed up and was to be announced by the Board of Governors the next, um, the next morning. Um, I, finally, I would note that by statutory design, the boards of the reserve banks are comprised of members with intentionally diverse financial interests and affiliations, such that the director's recommendations and advice on monetary policy include input from a diverse array of bankers, borrowers, and community leaders. Uh, because the boards, once again by statutory design, include bank executives and bank shareholders, many current directors would have conflicts of interest if the reserve bank boards of directors also had any authority over or any role in individual supervisory matters. Uh, matters like the New York Reserve Bank's rescue of AIG and the AIG counterparty transactions. But the New York Reserve Board does not have such authority, and it and I were walled off from these matters, really ring-fenced. Uh, I stand ready to answer any questions the committee may have. Mr. Friedman, um, let's begin with Mr. Baxter. Mr. Baxter, the committee notes um, that you have said publicly on a number of occasions that AIG and not the Federal Reserve of New York had the final say on disclosures. The committee has, uh, however, in its possession an email, I believe it is up there, it was obtained by subpoena. Um, it, it, um, it involves a senior person in your office, and the words said are, any public disclosure by AIG was still subject to FRS approval, Federal Reserve Service approval. That sound like, sounds pretty much like the Federal Reserve has the final approval with that kind of statement. If what you say about AIG having the final decision is true, why did a top New York Fed employee uh, say that the final approval, in effect, uh, rests with the, F the Federal Reserve? Madam Chairman, um, as I look at that email, I don't see it being addressed to me. So I will have to speculate as to why the author of that email included what do you, Who do you think it was addressed to, Mr. Baxter? You know, well, you know, uh, you don't just send emails in the air. Uh, I, I can't read it well enough, Madam Chair, to tell you, um, but it doesn't look like it's addressed to me. Madam Chair, I'm willing well, to speculate. Well, since, so. since you raised the, the issue of, of who it is um, from Stephen Mazzari to uh, Sarah Dahlgren. It is your top people, your proxies speak for you, do they not? They, they, are, they are not only very, very senior people, they are also very diligent people. And with respect to the email, uh, Madam Chair, it doesn't refer to securities disclosure. Um, it refers to a public disclosure by AIG, so I'd point that out as, as one item. With respect to AIG's securities disclosures, those are AIG's legal obligations under our securities laws, given that AIG was then and is now a publicly traded company. So in the first instance, AIG has a responsibility to comply with our securities laws, and that's the starting point. Now, it is true that AIG shared its securities law disclosures with the Fed. 
And it is true that the Fed commented on those draft securities law disclosures of AIG. Our purpose in making those comments was twofold. First, to assure accuracy, and second, to protect the taxpayer interest. But at no point, Madam Chair, did we ever interfere with a mandatory obligation of AIG to report to the SEC in a, in a securities filing. It was always for the two interests that I, that I mentioned, the interest of accuracy and the interest of protecting the taxpayer interest that we commented on AIG's public, list, public disclosures. Now, now it could not the, be. The word approval is a very troubling word here, because it, it implies it what it says. It is, Madam Chair, and it could not be for an AIG public filing an approval, because that legal obligation with respect to AIG's securities filings as a public company is AIG's. It cannot be delegated to someone else. Yeah, agreed. Not even someone at the Agreed, Federal but it looks as though. It looks as though a very powerful agency was saying otherwise. I agree with what you say, but that's not what the email said. And you can, uh, perhaps you can see why it, it, it makes it look as though the Federal Reserve of New York is not being up front with, was not being up front with the American people. Here behind the scenes were these, um, were these emails uh, that put the Federal Reserve in a position that you yourself indicate is not a position it can have under law. Correct. Um, uh, Mr. Borofsky, perhaps you can help me. I'm sitting here listening to um, this testimony, and I still cannot understand. I need uh, to understand, um, for a moment, putting yourself in the position of the parties, why you think uh, uh, AIG's counterparts were paid 100 cents on the dollar. Well, I think that you know, it, it's hard to put myself in, into to the shoes of, of either this, the, the counterparties or the Federal Reserve, but my understanding of the discussions, I certainly understand why the counterparties wanted to be paid 100 cents on the dollar. No, of uh, course, but that's not, why would the government want to do that? I mean, you, you cannot assume in a situation like this that somebody wants to do evil or wants to cheat the taxpayers. We're trying to find, get beneath the appearance, trying to place ourselves at the table with the parties, including the government, including the Federal Reserve, including AIG. So, so you yourself, in your testimony, lay out what had just occurred. Why would that procedure not be used? I, I cannot give you an answer to that question. I think that if, if that effort and that tone were there, I, Mr. Baxter could answer that question. Probably Secretary Geithner could best answer that question. Um, but put your, I mean, uh, again, if, if, uh, if you have to assume that, that uh, uh, the best and not the worst, then what would be the best reason I, for, for, for not using the government's bargaining power? I, I really cannot, I cannot imagine. I, I think that, again, if accepting the, the policy limitations that they, that they imposed upon themselves, and, and we don't accept them necessarily in the audit, but even accepting them, it seems to me that taking the effort, uh, you know, apparently you know, Secretary Geithner at the time was frequently speaking to the, the CEOs of, of many of these counterparties. It seems, to, it seems that just putting a little extra effort in, in, in trying to communicate the importance of this, I mean, negotiations were ongoing. It's not as if, as it, some may, may, may think, that they made no effort in negotiations. There was some effort in negotiations. So there was effort. So you know, when, when you say that they said, would you accept uh, 100 cents on the dollar, less than 100 cents on the dollar, well, anybody would answer no to that question. I mean, the surprising thing is that one of them did answer yes, and that wasn't pursued. And why do you think he answered yes and the others answered no? Um, I think they were willing to negotiate because I think that, you know, if you look at it from. Did from, he know the others had answered no? Well, he said yes only as long as all the others would say yes. So his idea was that we would do that. You be. Well, why didn't he this. stick with the others? I mean, there must have been some. Mr. Baxter, well, why would, what, you know, if you see that there's solidarity here and maybe you can get the government <laughs> where you want it, uh, why right. would, would one person say yes? He must have known something. He must have felt it, some, feel something for the country. Did he feel something for the economy that made him do it? Is he a patriot and the others not? 
I mean, I think that there was, you know, this was, this was UBS, and I think there probably was a recognition that the Federal Reserve had done so much for the global economy, and the American taxpayer, put in, putting the American taxpayer had sort of, had literally taken the entire global economy on its back and was supporting not just the U.S. institutions, but, but the global systemic risk that the sacrifices the taxpayer had made. And that, I think, is a powerful argument uh, to, in, in the context of negotiations if it's made clear how important it was to the American uh, decision makers, to the, to the principals. And I think that perhaps, I don't want to crawl into the mind of, of the UBS, but there was a willingness uh, to, to engage in these discussions, but as long as all the others. And because seven of the eight had said no, the Federal Reserve sh essentially shut down those negotiations. Um, but I think it is a very fair question to say, why not do something similar to what was done just a couple weeks before in Washington with respect to the capital purchase program, which is, again, those were not compelled, uh, a compelled transaction. It was ultimately a voluntary transaction, but it dealt with the negotiations, if you will, were conducted in a very, very forceful manner mm -hmm. uh, that made it very clear that this was a, 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 an issue of national importance. So I would ask you the same question, Mr. Baxter. To the, the one, one of the reasons why people are so angry at the banks and at the government is because this is a common sense question that anybody would ask without being very learned or very practiced in negotiation. So could you give us your answer? Uh, and I think, and I think, Madam Chair, this is a key question. The key question is why didn't the Federal Reserve um, act successfully to get a concession of perhaps? Is your mic on, sir? I think it is. Mm -hmm. why, why weren't we successful in getting a concession from the counterparties? Why wasn't AIG successful in getting a concession from the counterparties? Because that, that was the situation. A and it is related to bargaining power. Now, typically, when a debtor is trying to restructure a debt with a creditor, the bargaining power that the debtor gets, Madam Chair, is from the threat of bankruptcy. This negotiation with the counterparties was taking place in the first week of November 2008. So how would, it, how would the threat of bankruptcy have played during that particular period of time? And of course, Madam Chair, you know that the Federal Reserve had already interceded to save AIG from bankruptcy on September 16th of 2008, only six weeks before. So what about the bankruptcy threat? And I have three responses. First, that threat was not credible, given the actions of September 2008. Second, that, that threat of bankruptcy was not true. We weren't prepared to put AIG into bankruptcy in November of 2008. And we don't misrepresent situations in negotiations at the, the Federal threat, Reserve. But the threat was there. excuse me, the difficulty uh, uh, and the bargaining positions were there. So, so I, I still don't understand uh, why I ask a simple question, then proceed with business as usual as if uh, you weren't holding that threat card. And, and I'm trying to explain exactly why we had no bargaining power with respect to the bankruptcy risk. The first is it wasn't credible. The second is it wasn't true, and it would have been unethical for us to suggest otherwise. And the third is it would have been counterproductive, because the biggest threat we were facing at that point was the threat of the credit rating agencies downgrading Mr. Baxter, I understand that nuclear bomb threats are not credible. And I can understand your argument as to the insolvency. Mr. Borofsky, now, it's true that when you come in and you tell somebody you know, you're going to kill them, and you know for sure that you're not, <laughs> and they know for sure you're not, then the question becomes, what is the next step after the nuclear bomb threat? Sure. I, I think there's two things. First of all, what, what I was suggesting, the, uh, um, that the principals got involved in negotiation, I wasn't suggesting that they threatened bankruptcy. Uh, my, my, my comparison to, to what happened a couple weeks earlier was, again, was presuming all the, the restrictions that the Mr. Baxter and, and Secretary Geithner had, had put on themselves, including not wanting to threaten bankruptcy. So, so first of all, I think that what I was, when drawing this comparison, I wasn't suggesting that they do. Um, as to the complete absence of leverage, um, again, I think you have to look at this in the context of what the situation was, what the position of U.S. government officials explaining how important this was, much like they had two weeks earlier. 
And I don't think that they needed to threaten bankruptcy. However, as, as Secretary Geithner noted this morning, um, there was a very serious concern at the Federal Reserve and in the markets that there was going to be a downgrade of AIG, uh, a downgrade that, that Secretary Geithner and the Federal Reserve have indicated to us would have resulted in um, AIG going into bankruptcy despite the best efforts of the Federal Reserve. There was a limit on how much money perhaps the Federal Reserve was willing to print uh, at some point if it was, bankruptcy was triggered. Um, and I think that, again, without threatening bankruptcy, uh, I think that if there was a negotiation, if everyone was in the room, um, the Federal Reserve could point to the fact that there was a possibility of a downgrade. They could point to what the market was treating AIG's debt at the time. The, the credit default swaps were, were through the roof. There was fear in the market that AIG would default. Um, and again, without threatening the bankruptcy, could point out the fact that if there was not a resolution, if they didn't agree to a haircut, it may be difficult for the Federal Reserve to get board approval, for example, uh, to pay 100 cents on the dollar. That had not, they had not yet received that approval. Uh, what I'm saying is that there is a whole different range of options in that negotiation that could have occurred had they simply brought everyone in the same room uh, and if it was made a priority, if there was a level of effort across the board. I can't tell you if it would have worked. I have no idea if it would have worked. Well, have you ever heard a hundred, a hundred cents on the dollar being given in? I mean, we've had no situation like this, but isn't that even rare uh, as a as a way to come forward when you see a desperate situation on this on the side of the on on the other side? Surely, um, some gradations down from that were in order. And I guess I should ask Mr. Baxter. Um, the puzzling thing is that come up with 100 cents on a dollar without proceeding through some other process until you maybe had to get there. And we don't see, we, the committee does not see how you, and, and is, is bothered by the spontaneous <laughs> nature of the acceptance of the notion that the government had to pay 100 cents on the dollar. We've hardly heard of a negotiation in our lifetime. <laughs> where <laughs> that's what two unequal parties at the table end up doing. No concession, 100 cents on the dollar. So uh, perhaps you can tell us why what Mr. Borofsky says, at least some sense, yes, of course, you're not going to put them into bankruptcy. We do not question nearly as much the bottom line here as we question how you got to that bottom line. Well. Because we couldn't use the threat of bankruptcy, Madam Chair, one question was, could we use our regulatory or supervisory power? And we considered the answer to that question no, because that would have been an abuse of our power. And the reason we felt that is that it wasn't using the supervisory power with respect to an institution to get it to do something to enhance its safety and soundness. For example, like raise more capital. If an institution doesn't do that, then it's appropriate if the Fed believes there is insufficient capital to use a promise or a threat perhaps of enforcement action to induce the institution to take that action. This, that was not the case here. Here, the suggestion is we use our regulatory power to cause a counterparty to give up property in the form of a concession. So it's not using the regulatory power for the purpose intended by law it's using the regulatory power as a promise or a threat to extract money from someone. And that raises all kinds of considerations that are not consistent with the rule of law. And, and if so you just did, you, another point. You, you apparently didn't think you had to change the regulatory power in order to deal with Bank of America. Somehow you'd have to go back, change the law in order to deal with AIG. Well, Madam Chair, remember what happened when we asked the two French banks, Sokjen and Kalyan, if they would give a concession. Their first answer was no, and then they were supported in that negative answer by the French Banking Commission. So, so that happened with the two French banks. You also asked earlier about UBS. Now UBS said we might consider as much as a 2% concession, but only if everyone does it, everyone else does that as well. And so there was, there was a fairly effective blocking action there by UBS. Now, on the point about um, participating in the benefits of all of the Federal Reserve's and the Treasury's action in combating the financial crisis, with respect to UBS, Madam Chair, remember UBS had already been rescued 
by Switzerland in the financial crisis. So again, in UBS, we're dealing with UBS. We ask them if they would consider a concession. You know what their answer is, but, but it's a hard case to make that, that they owe the United States a favor when Switzerland had already come to their rescue. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. I'm going to move now, since I've had more than a lot of time because it took you all so long to get back. I'm going to move to the ranking member. I thank the chairwoman, and uh, I certainly uh, think that this was a good case for your not necessarily wanting a floor vote today, uh, but any but other not day. Tomorrow, sir. But not tomorrow. But not tomorrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Baxter, I didn't know who you were after 30 years of loyal service until a few days ago. So uh, forgive me for maybe not playing total catch-up. Your, uh, your old boss, uh, Secretary, now Secretary Geithner, uh, spoke glowingly about uh, the staff and the hard work and the people involved. But we now believe and understand that uh, a staff report was done within the Fed that said, let AIG go bankrupt, and that that was never, ever brought before the board, that in fact Sec uh, Chairman Bernanke pulled it so it not be considered by the broader Board of Governors. Are you familiar with that study or report? I am, I am not. You are not. So he kept it from a person who was at the, I mean these emails show you were at the center of all of this. He kept from you his own staff's decision. Chairman Bernanke did not trust his own governors or even the, the New York Fed's inner circle with a recommendation that said let him go bankrupt. Does that surprise you? First, uh, first ranking member, um, I'm, I'm the general counsel of the New York Fed. The chairman. But all, the, all that the question was, it was in the New York Fed. It well, was a study on behalf of the New York Fed. And well, I don't know the study, and, and I'm sorry I don't. Okay. Well, uh, with any luck, and with the indulgence of the chair, we will get discovery on that. As of right now, all I have is a whistleblower and one senator who confirmed that it exists but has said on, on CNBC that he can't release it even though he thinks it's damning. Uh, additionally, you're familiar with the Schedule A of the documents. Okay, so this, this unredacted form shows five, seven, 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 three, and some alpha numeric after that, and then shows that Deutsche Bank would be the, the counterparty recipient, the, the breakdown. Basically, these are sort of who owns the bonds, to put it in terms the American people would understand. Are you familiar with this document called Schedule A? Uh, it was delivered from the Fed. This is Schedule A to the shortfall agreement? Yes. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Are you familiar with the cover-up that said that, that, that AIG with the insistence of the Fed clearly perpetrated by getting this made confidential and not disclosed to the public until 2018, that work continuing until May of this year, or last year? Congressman, there was no cover-up. Um, I can explain the processing of the Schedule A well, to the Well, if you can just briefly agreement. tell me the first part, which is, are you familiar with the work that went on to seal this from being disclosed in public SEC filings at least until 2018. I am, I am familiar. Okay. And in a short way, do you think that is right or wrong? Uh, I, I think all of the conduct was perfectly appropriate. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that because although I don't agree, ultimately I just wanted that answer and we'll see uh, in time on other people. Can you uh, put up slide 23, please? Can you please explain what happened following your receipt of an email from Mar Marshall Hubner? And did AIG ever make this filing with the SEC? Would you like me to explain please, this? Please, as briefly as possible. This concerned um, a salary increase for the chief financial officer of AIG. and and Mr. Eubner was concerned about that salary increase. I was also concerned about that salary increase. And as a result of our collective concern, I had conversations with AIG, and the chief financial officer in question decided that he really did not want the salary okay. increase at this time. 
the salary increase was withdrawn. Okay, so be, by talking him out of it, it didn't have to show up in a public filing, so it, it no harm, no foul in this case. It had nothing to do with the public filing. It had everything to do with we didn't think this was appropriate. Okay. The salary increase. Uh, last question for you, and I want to quickly go to the SIGTARP. Do you know of a compelling legal authority that would have prevented AIG from going bankrupt? In other words, did the Fed have the authority to let them go bankrupt? Because Secretary Geithner has implied that he didn't have any options and he didn't have the authority to do anything but what he did. Uh, that's a pretty much yes or no. Did you or anyone at the New York Fed, to your knowledge, in fact, do a study or come up with a legal opinion that said you can't do anything else except let them go bankrupt or do this and you can't let them go bankrupt? First, we were not the supervisor of AIG on September 16th of 2008, so, so we had no supervisory no, no, but, but, responsibility. But my question is, Se since second. Secretary Geithner was there and said there was no other choice, your boss made the call. Do you know of a legal opinion that he was given or that exists today as to that? Well, I was his chief legal officer. And, and I would say then what I say now, and that is we need a resolution statute in this country to deal with institutions as systemically significant as AIG. We didn't have that tool in September of 2008, and we still don't have that tool, Congressman. Okay. We really need it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to ask just for two more minutes quickly to sort of counter the very long time, but I'll be very I brief. Yield. I thank the Chairman. You're the gentleman, two minutes. Uh, Mr. Borowski, your report directly contradicts so much of what we are hearing from people that were there or are there as to whether we will get paid back. Let me just break it down to just two questions and then take the rest of the two minutes for your answer. One, is it true that we are just not going to get paid back by anyone's reasonable estimation certain funds? And two, had, had we used other means to underwrite AIG, such as we will buy assets at a discount or we won't buy them. We will guarantee or give or, or buy at a discount. You decide whether you want our AAA rating versus actually getting the transfer at a time when these banks wanted to transfer. If any of these other techniques that you are now aware of that, that logically could have been used, would we be in as bad a situation of not getting paid back as we are? And then please uh, elaborate on what we are seeing of what we are not going to get paid back that flies, and that doesn't even include, by the way, the idea that the money has come back and it is being respent in other ways. But just as to the, the, your knitting, can you give us as much knowledge, as much time as, as we, you have to answer that? Sure. Uh, Ranking Member Rice, first of all, I just want to take the chance, uh, as I said in my initial testimony, to thank you and the Chairman uh, for your support of our organization and for the leadership and the tenacity that, that the two of you and this committee has shown in bringing transparency to the AIG bailout. Um, the Treasury's own calculations is when they did their financial statement at the year end, September 30, 2009, projected a more than $30 billion loss on its AIG investment. Um, when you are looking at these counterparty payments, um, you can't look at just one part of them. They, they were basically in two chunks, if you will. There is the Federal Reserve loan to Maiden Lane 3, which purchased the securities. It was about $29 billion. And the rest were counterparty payments, the, the balance of about $33 billion that AIG had previously made, so a total of about $62 billion. Now, with the chunk that the Federal Reserve lent to Made in Lane 3, that portion, which we have been hearing about how that is on track uh, to be paid back and the, tax may actually, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York may actually make a profit on that, I see no reason to think that that is not true. That, that, that may very well be accurate, that one piece of it. However, the other piece, and these really are two sides of the same coin, and we have been critical of trying to separate that out and only looking at the Federal Reserve piece and saying, oh, because that is going to get paid back, it is a profit. That other part is part of the projected $30 billion loss. So one of the reasons why we are so critical is that if you just say, oh, on these transactions where the Federal Government, the taxpayer, is on track to be made whole, for someone who is not as familiar with the intricacies of these transactions as, as we all are, you would get the misimpression that the counterparty payments, the decision to pay 100 cents on the dollar, is going to leave the taxpayer whole. And by Treasury's own calculations, you can't separate that $30 billion of, of, of anticipated loss um, from these transactions because the money that AIG paid 
came from a loan from the Federal Reserve, a separate loan, that was then paid down with taxpayer money through the TARP. So yeah. I think it's, I'm sorry, so I think it's, it's very difficult and it's, I think it's inappropriate to separate those two out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Mr. Chairman. Right. Uh, and now you'll uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses <coughs> for your willingness to help the committee with its work. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, we've been going back and forth with uh, Secretary Geithner and, and Secretary Paulson earlier today about uh, the decision to pay uh, the derivatives, the well, credit default swaps that were uh, entered into between AIG and, and Goldman Sachs and, and, and a, a handful of other companies. The position of the Secret Secretary Geithner is that uh, he didn't have any other tools other than paying 100 percent of the value, 100 cents on a dollar, or allowing AIG to go into default and bankruptcy. And uh, at least the testimony of Mr. Paulson is that he was not there. And uh, I find that mystifying. But were there, in your own impression and, and reviewing the record here, was there any opportunity for uh, Secretary Geithner, uh, the Treasury, the Fed, to negotiate a lower, negotiate a haircut with Goldman Sachs instead of paying them uh, at par value? Um, and, and thereby saving the American taxpayer possibly billions of dollars. Um, yes, and I think that as the Federal Reserve and, and the Secretary acknowledged, the whole plan, the, the hope from the Federal Reserve was to attempt a negotiated haircut. So a, if there was an agreement among the parties to pay, to accept less than par, that obviously wouldn't have violated any of the policy concerns that have been described. Um, and I think very much these negotiations could have been conducted in a different way a more forceful way. The comparison that, that you cited to Secretary Geithner earlier um, and which is discussed in our testimony is, is looking back to the capital purchase program uh, when the nine banks were, were summoned to Washington, D.C. Um, and as mentioned in my testimony, that is a pretty good example of what could have been done. Um, in there, of course, it was the principles that were involved in the negotiations for both sides whether it was the Secretary, then President Geithner, Secretary Paulson, Chairman Bernanke on behalf of the government, and the Chief Executive Officers of the nine banks on the other side. That didn't happen with AIG. Um, the forcefulness of those negotiations, uh, being told that this was important for the American people. Now, I'm not suggesting threatening to pull their license or, or using regulatory authority to punish those that didn't participate, but right. emphasizing how important it was to the policymakers in the United States government. That didn't happen. Uh, with respect to AIG. And indeed, again, these were conversations that were done largely over the telephone of mid-level executives. Those nine executives were summoned to D.C. For, for the TARP, and they were put around the table. And that communication, that this is really important, uh, and we could, you know, we, I could continue to speculate and, and give about nine or ten other things that could be said, all I think within the confines of the Fed's policy considerations. Now, We've, we've been somewhat critical of some of those policy considerations, and you know, we disagree with some of them as reflected in the audit. But I think that what's, what's bothersome is that even if you accept all of those concerns, they could have just tried a little harder. Uh, and maybe it would have been unsuccessful. Uh, we don't know. But as I, as, I, as I noted in my testimony, we recently spoke to the French regulator, and they said if the negotiations went something like that, they would at least be willing to engage. As, and we know that UBS would have been willing to engage. And we don't know what the reaction is of the other potential counterparties because that telephone conversation from then President Geithner or then Secretary Paulson or Chairman uh, Bernanke saying, hey, this is important. We want you to be involved. We know they were talking to these CEOs on a regular basis, but this wasn't elevated to that level. And we'll, we will never know what the result might have been, but it may have resulted in saving the taxpayers billions, if not tens of billions of dollars. But we just don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baxter. Um, Maybe you've been asked this question before, but uh, in terms of the decision to, to make the payment uh, at 100 cents on the dollar, uh, were, you, were you part of that discussion? I wasn't in the, the discussions with the counterparties, Congressman, but I was part of the, the supervisory team. How did you arrive at that? Could you tell me? Um, I can try. 
the, first of all, there was a critical deadline, Congressman, of November 10th, and that was the day that AIG was going to announce a $25 billion loss in its 10Q it's for the third quarter. So we were looking at that, and we were being told by the credit rating agencies that unless something happened with respect to the credit default swaps on or before November 10th, that there was a strong probability of a downgrade. Now, a downgrade would have been catastrophic. It would have brought us back to where we were in September on the brink of an AIG bankruptcy. So from those of us who were working on at the New York Fed, we looked at that as a hard deadline. And the execution risk of failing to get the credit default swaps torn up by that date was, was it would put us back on the brink of bankruptcy. So that was, that was the risk of deal failure. That was the execution risk. So we had to get the deal done. AIG had been unable, as Mr. Habayeb has testified, to get that, those credit default swaps torn up. On November 6, Congressman, we got formal authorization from Stacia Kelly, who was then AIG's general counsel, to take over and see whether we could get those credit default swaps terminated by deadline. So we were operating against the clock to do that. Our choices were, should we push for concessions and try to use whatever leverage we had to get those concessions, or should we simply go to par, which would apply to every counterparty, and the way PAR works is you offset the collateral that these counterparties had been pulling out of AIG right. against, you offset that collateral yeah. against the PAR price of the bonds. So, so those, were the, those were the weighing of the risks as we faced them. And on the one hand, failure to get a deal on or before the 10th would have brought us back to the brink of an AIG bankruptcy. So the, the risk was in pushing for concession of perhaps 2%, we risked billions of further federal government assistance. Now, now, what happened? We asked eight counterparties about concessions. Seven said no. Two of those seven were French, and they were supported by the French government in their refusal. The, the one that said perhaps was UBS. It said perhaps up to 2%, but we need to be treated just like everybody else. So had we continued to use whatever leverage we had, and as I said earlier, we didn't have much. We risked losing the deal by November 10th, and that would have brought us right back to September to the brink of an AIG bankruptcy and to catastrophic systemic consequences that would have resulted. That balancing led us to see that the, the, the solution would be to go with no concessions, we brought that to President Geithner. He agreed, and that's what we did. But we time brought it home by deadline. We got it done by the 10th. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Did, did I hear, Mr. Baxter, did you say that um, Mr. Geithner signed off on paying at par? He was part of that decision? He did. Um, I didn't have that impression earlier, but maybe I misunderstood something. Um, that uh, I'm not sure who to ask this particular question to first, but let me ask Mr. Uh, Borowski. Um, in the uh, one of the the questions here is my understanding was to avoid the uh, and, and part of the question for the secrecy was to avoid the risk of the rating agencies downgrading uh, the securities and bonds. Um, do, is that true? Is that your impression? The Federal Reserve has cited as one of the reasons for justifications for paying the counterparties at par was one of the concerns about the effect of the rating agencies and, and the impact. Um, why, uh, why hadn't they already been downgraded? Well, they actually had, had been downgraded up, up until that point. But Do you believe they were keeping up? In other words, my, in many, the many hearings that you've been here and so on, it seems to me that to have a, a private economy work, one thing has to happen is the, because, you know, CalFed or whatever the big uh, insurance for state employees there is the biggest, I guess, investor, and he said he's only got a couple of people to track. If those rating agencies aren't accurate, the no, whole and, and system collapses, and it's, it seemed to be questionable whether they were moving fast enough in the economy uh, to, to downgrade it. And in effect, here, a, a partner in the Fed was trying to help disguise it. 
I mean, ultimately, one of the, the observations in our audit is the outsized influence the credit rating agency had throughout this process. Um, as, as Mr. Baxter just stated, it was basically the rating agencies that were holding the gun to the head of the Federal Reserve, giving them the perception they had to move so quickly. It was the rating agencies that gave the fear to the Federal Reserve, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I'm paraphrasing Mr. Baxter, but that fear that, that AIG would be put into bankruptcy. Uh, that that was a legitimate fear that the Federal Reserve had because of the result of the rating agencies. And of course, so much of the lead up to AIG's problems were the result of the rating agencies, first overvaluing uh, the, the, the CDOs and the bonds that underlie the, the credit default swaps, and then throughout the process. Indeed, it was the rating agencies um, who were ultimately looked at the original deal that the Fed brokered with AIG and the high interest rate and determined that too would lead to an eventual downgrade. So, yes, they had an outside role, role in this for sure, okay. for certain. Mr. Baxter, my question to you would be, how can a free market economy work if uh, the Fed tries to manipulate the rating agencies by pumping money in and trying to conceal that? We never tried to manipulate the rating agencies, Congressman. We, we took their observations as they gave them to us, never tried to lever them in terms of what they were going to do with respect to AIG. Instead, what we tried to do was to restructure AIG to avoid a downgrade. Now, in the context of November 10th, and this is, a, this is an important point with respect to the credit default swaps, had that downgrade occurred, many of the counterparties would have had a right to terminate their credit default swaps, which would have enabled them to keep the cash collateral posted and the bonds. And, and that, that, is a, that is a critical piece here because the way we restructured these credit default swaps, the Fed took the bonds into our vehicle made in lane three. And remember, the bonds had diminished in value from par to approximately half, and the, the counterparties had gotten collateral for that diminution in value. As those bonds, which we now have in our vehicle, as those bonds come back in value, as our nation emerges from the worst financial crisis in 70 years, we capture that value in a Federal Reserve vehicle. And, and, and so it is, it is the offset, if you will, in broad terms, conceptual terms, to the collateral that was posted. And, and so this is another important feature of the restructuring that the Fed did, which was far, far better than the alternative of allowing there to be a rating agency downgrade and, and, and why those did you catastrophic want that? Why did you want to conceal that? But never wanted to conceal that, Congressman. Um, it, it, it is, and Did we you, tried. Is it inaccurate to say that you asked for special conditions where the mar where markets wouldn't be able to see for fear they might speculate if they saw that you were taking uh, this well, position? Well, first, with respect to the Schedule A, to the shortfall agreement, which had the counterparty names, the QSIPs, the tranches, it was never the intention of AIG or the Fed for that schedule to be filed with a shortfall agreement. So there was a misunderstanding in the beginning. I think, as to why that wasn't attached. Now, the Commission came back and said, we need, we need that exhibit attached. And then we made an application for confidential treatment because we thought that information would hurt the taxpayer interest in our vehicle. Now, the information I'm talking about are the counterparty names, the QSIP numbers identifying the bonds we hold, and the tranches. After the hearing that occurred before this committee in March, we and AIG changed our view on the counterparty names. So the only information today that is confidential with respect to the Schedule A is the QSIP numbers and the tranches, the identifying information for the cards, if you will, that the Fed holds in its hand in this vehicle. That's what we're keeping confidential now, and for the right reasons, because we're worried when we sell out that portfolio that if, they, if the street knows what we're holding, it'll hurt the taxpayer interest. That's the only reason. It's not a cover-up. Well, gentlemen's time, it gentlemen's it time, gentlemen's, gentlemen, gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, well, we now you have five chance. minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Chairman, uh, Inspector General Varosky, thank you again for all the work you and your team have done over the last year, and uh, it's been simply invaluable. Uh, 
when I and 26 of uh, my colleagues wrote to request that you conduct an audit of the issues before us today, our main concern was the decision-making process leading to paying AIG's counterparties at 100 percent par value. However, after Bloomberg and the New York Times published emails surrounding the disclosure, questions began to emerge about how the events surrounding the Maiden Lane uh, 3 transactions were disclosed to the SEC. One of the first things I did was send you a letter asking whether your staff already knew about the emails that were released to the press and did these emails affect the conclusions that you reached in your audit. I was also interested in whether you plan to open the audit. You responded quickly, uh, as you recall, saying that it was not your policy to comment on open investigation. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And I want to clarify, I want to clarify, in, in, in your office, audit and investigations are different tasks conducted by different personnel in different divisions. Is that right? That's correct, generally speaking. Okay. And what are the missions of those divisions? Sure. Audit, as, as, as you know, um, under ESA, we are, have the responsibility to both audit and investigate all actions taken under the top TARP. The best way, to, I think, to think of audit, it is almost an investigation without the presumption that there was a crime mm -hmm. uh, or a violation. It is a, it is a review, a historical review of what occurred and, and looking to see what went wrong, what went right, and explaining, bringing basic transparency and making recommendations. Our investigations division is a law enforcement uh, agency. We are like the FBI for the, for, for the TARP. Um, these are, it is populated generally by special agents who have full law enforcement authority, guns, badges, and the authority to, to make arrests. We also have attorney advisors and support personnel. And when we move something into the investigations division, it is because we are taking a look to see if there was misconduct. Uh, if there is some reason or there is an allegation or we suspect in certain cases whether there is a crime or even a civil violation, we do support civil investigations as well, we move it over into that section. Mm -hmm. So with respect to, to your letter and the request, we didn't receive um, many of the documents that this committee received, and um, including those documents as well as some other documents that pertain very directly to some of the um, issues directly addressed in the audit. And we does, does it surprise you that you didn't receive them when you would, I mean, now looking at back? Some of the documents, I'm extremely surprised that we didn't receive. Um, and that's why we're conducting a new investigation to determine what the circumstances were of why some specific documents that we requested uh, were not provided to us. So I, an open investigation is not the same as an open audit, is that right? That, that's correct, sir. And I assume you cannot say whether the open investigation is civil or criminal, is that correct? Well, an investigation at this stage in particular, we're just starting out. We're just taking a look and see where it goes. Uh, if it does result in, in our belief for a referral for, for civil or criminal prosecution, we would do that. We would then interact with the Department of Justice. We don't have prosecutorial authority. If we determine otherwise, um, especially with, protect, with, result, with um, respect to these investigations, we have the option of preparing an investigative report which will provide to you and this committee reporting on our findings. Can you tell us what the time frame is for this? Or you, just, you just have to take your time and face, you to, can't figure that one out, huh? We're going, I mean, for us to do this right, 250,000 pages of documents that this committee received, we also received. Um, that's going to take us some time because we really can't determine what we didn't receive until we go through literally every page of those documents. Uh, and given the significance and importance of this, of this matter, um, I usually uh, drive my agents pretty hard and ask them to move very, very quickly. Uh, in this instance, I told them, above all, to move quickly, but we need to be very thorough and very accurate. And that will be followed as all investigations by a series of interviews once we get our hands around the, the, the document. So I, I hesitate to, to, I to put a time. Bloomberg reported this morning that you are, quote, probing whether the New York Fed improperly limited the release of information about payments to AIG's bank counterparties. Is this correct? Or can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, we also have opened a, a probe into some of the allegations that came here. And again, I, I really want to stress that when we open an investigation, we are not presuming misconduct or, or anything like that. It has been suggested that there was misconduct. Again, and so what we are doing, it is our job, our responsibility, our statutory responsibility when, when such issues are raised, we have to go look at it. And as I said, uh, if, if everything was done in a legally um, correct manner, 
we'll report that. I see my time Thank is you. up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, and now you have five minutes to uh, Congressman Bacchus. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bobsky, I'm going to ask you this question. You know, Secretary Geithner says that they didn't disclose some things, but now they've come, they've fully disclosed everything, and they're trying to inform the American people. However, uh, I think his testimony today uh, appears to mislead the American people. And let me ask you about that. On page 10 of his testimony, he's talking about the AIG uh, bailout. We paid the fair market value at the time for the assets. Uh, essentially, what the Federal Reserve did was to purchase these securities from the counterparty with a par value of $62 billion for a purchase price of $27 billion. That's not true, is it? It is partially true. Partially um, true. What they don't say is they got $27 billion of taxpayer funding and they got to keep $35, $35 billion worth of collateral. I mean, it is true, in addition to the $27 billion that came from Made in Lane 3, all that other AIG collateral that they previously been paid, which was made possible largely by uh, the other loan from the Federal Reserve, which was backfilled $40 billion by, by, by taxpayer money. And um, I think in, in the Secretary's full testimony, he does acknowledge that there is an AIG loss. What we cite in our testimony was a statement that was put out by Treasury. Uh, which was completely unbalanced and gave the impression that the taxpayers would be made whole because of that narrow issue of Maiden Lane. And, and well, we that's think that's actually, actually what this statement this morning to me says, that they, they, uh, they purchased securities with a par value of $62 billion for a purchase price of $27 billion. It is literally true in the Maiden Lane 3 facility that is what occurred. It is literally true. Yeah. He said, in the end, the prices paid for the securities were their fair market value. That's not true either, is it? Well, again, with respect to the Maiden Lane 3 part of it, it is literally true, but it, it, to look at these transactions as a whole, when you look, the counterparties did receive 100 cents on the dollar for those securities and for tearing up the credit for default right. swap contracts. So the total compensation, when you include the collateral they were able to keep, yeah. was, was you know, effectively but, par value. Because the counterparties, they received $62 billion and all, they $27 billion of it paid directly from the special purpose vehicle. Uh, Mr. Baxter, Mr. Uh, Mr. Friedman, you'd agree with that. They received $27 billion from the special purpose vehicle. Is that correct? I think it's very important, Congressman Bacchus, to understand that we paid for multi-sector CDOs with a par value of $62 billion. Right. Our vehicle paid $29 billion. $29, all right. Now, now $27 went to the counterparties, two went to AIG. Okay. Another important aspect of this is then we receive those multi-sector CDOs into our vehicle. With respect to the cash collateral that AIG posted, but what I'm saying, this is important. This is important. But I'm country. saying to say that the, we we that now can recapture that, but because as those multi-sector CDOs come back in value, as our nation emerges from you, the worst financial crisis in 70 years, well, I understand about the word. But what I'm saying, then the value comes back. But but what I'm saying, it was 27 billion, and then it was it was 30. Five billion dollars worth of collateral that the counterparties were allowed uh, to keep, which they were legally entitled to. Oh, I understand that, but what I'm saying to say that this, you know, that for 27 billion you got 62 billion dollars worth of assets is certainly not the tr whole truth, is it? The whole truth, Congressman, is you have. No, I'm asking you. you, have, you I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. You have insurance policies in the form of a CDS. You have assets that are insured. We got the assets. You, what happened with AIG is they got to tear up the insurance policy right. that was threatening its survival. Right. Secretary, Guy, I'm not, I understand that, all that. I mean, I, I've heard that repeatedly. That's the whole truth. But he also says that the fair market value, that you paid the fair market value. But these, some of these uh, uh, CDOs, some of them were, they were rated CCC or lower, and the market prices at the time a lot of them were 20 cents and below that. Is that not correct? Well, Congressman, I'm a lawyer. I won't, uh, I won't comment on the value of any particular asset because it's beyond my, my sure. competence. 
uh, let in, me in our this. view, in our view, in the view of our experts. Well, BlackRock, who the Fed hired, said that uh, they said there was no that the uh, they valued the paper at the average of less than fifty cents on the dollar. That's that in November less, of two thousand. That would have been somewhat less than thirty-one billion dollars. In November of two thousand eight, at the one of the worst points in our financial crisis. The loan we made from the Fed to Maiden Lane 3, the vehicle that's holding the assets, is a six-year loan, and we have a right of renewal. So we can hold these assets. Well, I, just, I understand all that, but I'm saying at the time you paid par for something that was trading. BlackRock says they were trading 50 cents on the dollar. We paid fair value. All right. Gentlemen, time what? has expired. Yeah, we have to. Um, now you have five minutes to the gentlewoman from New York, Congresswoman Maloney. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for yielding, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for holding this uh, hearing. Uh, along with many of my colleagues, we pushed very hard to have full disclosure, and and I would like to put in the record uh, letters that uh, I wrote to the Fed requesting uh, full disclosure, along with letters from many of my constituents. With, without objection, so ordered. Okay. I would like to get back to Mr. Bacchus's questioning and uh, Mr. Bax Baxter where you, you bought the, the sixty two billion for twenty nine billion. Uh, my question is what is the value now? Um, the uh, the value now uh, I I can't say, Congressman. Um, our Well did the taxpayers win or lose? Right as of today we have uh, we have a situation where our loan balance is four billion dollars less than the than the amount of the portfolio, which I'll, I'll estimate, and and I think I need to estimate. Our loan balance is around around 17, and the portfolio is around 21, 22. Well, let let's get back to the line of questioning from Mr. Cummings. Uh, I, I know and. And we all know that we released uh, the names of the counterparties, but I understand uh, that you still want to withhold other information concerning these assets. And what is that information? And why do you want to continue to keep it a secret? Uh, we believe in Congress, uh, many of us, that the sunshine is the best disinfectant and, uh, and, and anti corruption and fraud deterrent. So why must we? Why do you feel this should be kept secret? What is it and why, should, why do you feel you, we want to keep it secret? The, the information that we are still concerned about at the Fed on the Schedule A to the shortfall agreement is information about the QCIP numbers and tranches of the multi-sector CDOs that the Fed now has in Maiden Lane 3, its vehicle. Our experts, BlackRock, tell us that if, if we publish that information, when the day comes, and it may be four years, it may be six years, it may be longer, when the Fed wants to sell those assets, that we will be hurt. We will be hurt because traders in the market will know what we're holding. Like in a card game, if one player shows his hand to everyone else, that one player is prejudiced. So, so that's the worry. The worry is it will injure the taxpayer interest if we show our hand, if we show our QCIP numbers in our tranches. So, so, so that is the key. And we well, applied well, Mr. for Mr. Baxter, uh, reclaiming my time, isn't it uh, standard policy for investors to disclose holdings like these in securities filings? Well, these particular multi sector CDOs, it is not customary, I am told, for investors to put this information out. And if you do, again, I'm relying on what uh, what experts at BlackRock have told us. If you do, you can be gamed by hedge funds and sophisticated players when the time comes when you want to sell. So, so you're saying that the public, uh, the taxpayer, would be at greater risk in uh, it, the ability to reclaim these funds if this information was disclosed. Is that true? That that is true, Congresswoman. I would also wonder why the average American would need to know the precise QCIP numbers and tranches of the Maiden Lane portfolio. It is the kind of information that, at least in my household, my family wouldn't, wouldn't know how to, uh, how to interpret. But, mm -hmm. but sophisticated players, hedge funds, traders on the street, 
they could game us if that information was out there. Going forward, uh, uh, the Financial Services Committee has uh, passed a, a regulatory reform bill that includes in it resolution authority, which would be a uh, wind down authority. So hopefully we would not be in this type of crisis again. And I would like to uh, ask Mr. Friedman uh, from, you, you say you were privy to this information, but your experience in, in uh, finance, uh, do you think things would have been different if uh, there was a more formal process for AIG, such as this resolution authority? And uh, could you tell us the difference between a government or taxpayers bailing out AIG and Lehman, which is a question many of my constituents uh, uh, are perplexed over? What was the difference between the two in, in, in response? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as, as I mentioned, when um, you and many of your colleagues were voting, the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is ring fenced away from these um, supervisory, regulatory, or, um, or and, and certainly these uh, extraordinary issues. So I have no direct knowledge from that standpoint of this. Uh, as far as, so what I'm giving you is my opinion, just as a person who's been around markets for many years, uh, I, I, do, I do believe that um, for our financial system to work effectively, we have to get away from too big to fail, uh, too intertwined to fail. I, I think these are, um, are, are, are dangerous things. Uh, and I, I earnestly hope that as Congress works its way through restructuring our financial regulatory system, they will have some form of resolution authority to give the, um, the people who are on the firing line the next time a crunch comes. Uh, and one will come at some point in the future, the ability to uh, affect some sort of a conservatorship or resolution to wind down these entities. Uh, I think that um, people who are making money in markets um, should be at risk of losing money. Uh, but if there is not the ability to do this without jeopardizing the entire financial system of the country, uh, <coughs> and very much including Main Street, I think people get their, their, their uh, hands tied behind their back. So I, I, I earnestly hope we will have some kind of a resolution authority. Uh, as far as the difference between Lehman Brothers and AIG, I have no direct inside knowledge of this. I, I, can, I can say that um, AIG was a, um, to an outside observer, um, was a much bigger, more complex, and even more dangerous to the economy type of a situation. And there may well have been, a, a, and, and this uh, uh, Mr. Baxter would be much better able to answer than I, there may have been a, very much a difference in terms of the, the Fed's ability to enter into it uh, based on the quality of the collateral they could get. But that I, I can't speak to personally myself. Gentle, gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, thank you. Uh, I yield now uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank each of you for being here. Uh, Mr. Friedman, let me ask you, what was the role of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the decision to compensate AIG counterparties at par? Yeah, sir, my, my um, um, strong understanding and recollection of our role is that we were in effect a advisory board on most issues with administrative responsibilities for things like um, controls, audit committee, et cetera. And so we were walled away, ring fenced away from regulatory issues, supervisory issues, or the extraordinary types of um, emergency interventions that took place during 2008. Um, if you um, think of the makeup of the board, um, during my tenure, something like um, six of the nine members were e either had some affiliation with banks or with financial institutions. So there would have been myriad conflicts if we had, had been involved. 
uh, the, uh, in, in my experience, the staff of the bank was very meticulous in um, keeping us involved in these transactions. So I can say that um, um, I played no role in any of these decisions or in ratifying them. Uh, I've been advised very recently that um, on the night that the um, AIG transaction was finalized, uh, I and the um, chairman of our audit committee received a courtesy summary briefing from the um, from Fed officials telling us what had happened and that this would be announced the next morning. So I hope that's responsive. Well, let me ask, during the time period in October and November of 2008, when the Federal Reserve Board of, of, of New York staff were deciding how to address the problems, how to deal with them. Uh, did you get any briefings from the staff on the actions that they were taking and the policy options that they were considering? I, I, I recollect no such briefings during the period that they were trying to determine what to do. Uh, I, I recollect not have no recollection of ever being asked for my views or proffering my views. I have a recollection of um, after the September um, intervention with the AAG was being uh, was carried out, that evening being getting a courtesy summary posting from Mr. Geithner telling us what they had done, which would be in the newspapers the next day. And all of this was consistent with the design, as I understand it, of, of, of the statute that, uh, that a prior Congress passed for how the Federal Reserve Banks should, uh, should operate. Let me ask, you are on the Gold, Goldman Sachs Board of Directors. Yes, sir. And you were on the Goldman Sachs Board of Directors in late 2008, is that? Yes, sir. As the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of New York, Bank Board of New York, Board of Directors, do you think your access to information and the decision-making process at the Fed gave Goldman Sachs an advantage in weathering the storm when there were so many other yeah. firms um, floundering and, and yeah. folding? Uh, sir, absolutely none, uh, because the staff of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, in my experience, was very careful and meticulous to keep us away from any information that would um, be of that the type of nature you, you talked about. We had we had the potential for conflicts was 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 ripe there. You know, the purpose of that board, the primary purpose, as I saw it, was it it gave the president of the bank a group of of knowledgeable market people that he could get information from as to what was happening in their areas their com their business areas and their communities and i would i would speculate that if you had a federal reserve bank in in an area in the southwest you'd want oil expertise in an agricultural area you'd want people with farm expertise we had, uh, we had a lot of financial market expertise, but the discussions were at the, uh, the, the level of what are you seeing in the markets, what are you seeing in the economy. Uh, they wouldn't ever tell you what was happening at another bank, which was probably a competitor of one you were affiliated with. And uh, I, I just think it was handled in a very um, professional and meticulous fashion. So the firewalls were, were yep there that would prevent any conflict of interest? In my experience, they were very carefully uh, supervised, sir, and, and I, I, I never had a sense that anyone had any desire to transgress. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I now yield myself five minutes, but I will yield a minute to the gentleman from Massachusetts before I raise my questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Friedman, just following up on, on uh, Mr. Davis's uh, question. I'm concerned about the overall influence of uh, Goldman Sachs in Treasury and, and at the Fed. And I think your own situation is somewhat instructive. 
as I understand, you, you were previously on the Goldman Sachs Board of Directors? I, I was. During the period you've been discussing, I was, and I'm still on this. Right. Okay. And then you, you, you went, became a member of the New York Fed Board of Governors? Yes, sir. Okay. And while you were there, uh, apparently you, you owned uh, a significant amount of shares in, in uh, Goldman Sachs, but that was okay at the time because they were not a bank holding company, right? Yes, sir. And then, and then when they became a bank holding company, uh, you had a decision to make, and that was to either divest, right, or, yeah. or get a waiver. Yeah, and, uh, and you applied for the waiver. Well, the, 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 Fed, uh, the Fed staff applied for the waiver. I did not apply for the waiver. Okay. And then while the waiver was pending, you bought 37,000 more shares of, of Goldman Sachs. Yeah. What Just, was the thinking behind that? Let, let me tell you what the, um, when, um, when I went on the Fed board, uh, the Fed Reserve Board. I was a director of Goldman Sachs. I had Goldman Sachs shares, and I would be regularly receiving Goldman Sachs shares as part of your directorship grants. I get that part, but okay. but if if you're not in compliance and you're asking for a waiver, what 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 about the decision to buy 37,000 more shares of Goldman Sachs? Okay. At, at the time, Goldman Sachs became a um, bank holding company. I was then became technically ineligible to be a Class C director. So there were a number of options. I, I, was, I, was not, I was not going to, at that point, it would not have been feasible for me to resign from the Goldman Sachs board uh, and sell all my shares. I had done that several years before when I went to, the, um, uh, to take an administrative post in a, in a prior administration. So that left two options. One was for the um, Fed to basically say, your status has changed, you need to resign, in which case I would have um, promptly um, um, saluted smartly and resigned that afternoon. Excuse me, sir, I'm sorry, but your answer is for the last three minutes has been unresponsive. So you, you knew you were not in compliance, you had to apply for a waiver to stay, to stay yeah. in, that, okay. in that position, yet you bought 37,000 yeah. more shares. Can you, can you please, and I don't mean to badger you, but could you ask, answer that part of the question? I will. Uh, my understanding of the practices and precedents of the Federal Reserve was that during the pendency of a waiver, uh, you continued on in your um, role as a director and the rules were in abeyance. And that was actually the practice of what happened. I, no. I continued uh, chairing the board. Uh, ultimately during this period when Mr. Geithner was tapped to go to Washington. I, I still don't understand. And I. I I, during this period, uh, I made a decision in December to buy some Goldman Sachs shares. This did not change the um, eligibility at all because you, you know, just own more, more, more gold. Here's the problem. You, as, as a member of the Board of Governors, you're making decisions on, on matters that directly affect Goldman Sachs. And, and, and your former shareholder, current shareholder, and then you buy 37,000 more shares yeah. of, of, of that company that you're, you're overseeing. Yeah. That, that, therein lies the problem. Let me ask you, I, I notice in dealing with Treasury and the Fed that there are a lot of Goldman Sachs employees all over the place here. Right. Is, the, is there any type of program where uh, Goldman encourages their employees yeah. to, to sort of salt the uh, – the, the, the regulators' offices that they, they are regulated by? Certainly none whatsoever in the sense of, gee, this is some kind of a firm strategy. That yeah. I can tell you. What there has been over the years is a certain tradition that you, you, you work here, you try to do well for yourself and your family, and then you give back and you do public service. For many years, this was regarded as a um, uh, as a very constructive and positive thing. I can see Recently, that. Recently, yes. it's gone the other way, and people are, are thinking, is there some ulterior motive? Well, well when reclaiming push comes my to shove. Time, uh, reclaiming it, my time. Uh, yeah, you oh, know, <laughs> it was, you know, initially it was <laughs> a minute, you You've know? been very generous, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd ask I unanimous consent that the chairman have an additional minute added. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, let me just say that um, we're going we're gonna to close out. Um, but just before we close, Mr. Friedman, let me just ask you, um, 
you still sit on the board of, uh, uh, of Goldman Sachs, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and the CEO of Goldman Sachs has uh, said that he didn't need the billions he received in, in counterparty payment from AIG. He said he, he didn't really need it. If that's the case, why doesn't Goldman, Goldman Sachs give back the money? Mr. Friedman, my advice to Goldman Sachs is just come clean and say you need the money and you appreciate the fact that the American taxpayers were so generous. Why not? Yeah. You were talking, sir, about a, um, about a, uh, a financial transaction where the Goldman Sachs people were in a commercial transaction with AIG. That's correct. And they had, um, they had entered into it at a time when AIG was a AAA company and they were doing it acting as intermediaries for Goldman Sachs clients. Uh, they had um, worked very carefully in their risk management to protect themselves against um, a deterioration in the value of these um, CDOs or in a deterioration of the value of AIG and they felt that they were that they were um, fully hedged and had protected their shareholders' interests. Uh, I, I, I do not think that there, was, there is any feeling there that they did anything other than what a market participant would do in the normal course. You're saying they did not need it. Is well, that what you're saying? What, what, I, what, I would say was, what I would say was this. Um, Goldman Sachs has consistently said they, they there was something like $20 billion, round numbers for illustrative purposes, of instruments that they sought insurance on. There was a deterioration in the value of that, let's say illustratively roughly half. They felt that AIG, from whom they had purchased this credit insurance, owed them $10 billion. They had $7.5 billion of collateral. That left a shortfall of 2 and a half. They had um, purchased insurance on AIG's survival from other major institutions and had collateral and netting arrangements with these other institutions. So what they've consistently said is that their exposure, their direct exposure, and they've used that word direct exposure to AIG, was not material. Now, I, I, I am not going to say that, and, and this may be the point that the SIGTARP made, but I'm not going to say that in the event of a financial Armageddon, all bets weren't off, but they are the stewards for the money of their shareholders. Right. And that's, that's, the, that's the... Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, just a couple of quick UCs. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to submit both their opening statements and any follow-up questions on any, to any of our witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the letters earlier uh, submitted, uh, that if the uh, Chair would re uh, eliminate his reserve at this time, uh, these are letters that you were copied to a long time ago. Right. Hopefully. Definitely. Um, Still reserving the right to object, but uh, because uh, some of them I'm not sure I've seen, so I want to make certain that we see them. I, I really don't really see a problem, but just in case there is a problem, I want to reserve the right. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw my UC on that and uh, simply submit them as new questions for the record. Perhaps okay. that'd be easier. Without objection. Uh, and then last, the uh, the UC on or second last the UC on the Schedule A. Are you prepared to withdraw your re reservation on that mm, at this time? I'm prepared to withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And last. Mm. Uh, earlier you had said that you would uh, compel witnesses to answer. It is a custom of the committee that it be seven days. Could I have unanimous consent that seven days after their receipt uh, they be expected to respond to our questions? Without objection. We'll thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this incredibly successful hearing. I think this is probably our finest bipartisan hour. I think the witnesses, whether they like the questions or not, would certainly agree it was bipartisan. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, thank uh, all of our witnesses uh, for being here today. And of course, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to come. And, uh, and without objections, I enter this binder into the committee record. But before we adjourn, let me state that if the AIG bailout and the government's involvement in it 
teaches us anything. It shows that deals with the taxpayers' dollars that are made in secret results in distrust and deep, deep, deep disappointment. When taxpayers' dollars are involved, transparency must be first and the last focus of the government. Again, let me thank you very, very much for your Mr. testimony. Mr. Chairman. Yield to the gentleman from Could uh, I, with your leave, just mention one email in particular that I think highlights what you just said? And let me just say to you, um, put it in writing. All right. He will answer it, and we will move forward. Thank you very much. Next month marks one year since Congress passed the economic stimulus money. Of the $787 billion approved, just under $330 billion has been committed.